Get up there, Gubba. Uh, oh. Yeah. Oh. That's your cue. <laughs> <laughs> I have so what the heck? My mic. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna do. Oh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna run into another Jack piece. This is also hard as hell to read. Oh, and nobody's ever done it. I did it yesterday, which was only th this book, Pick, by Jack. Oh, thanks. Nobody has ever performed this book, including Jack, ever done it at a microphone, nor anybody at any show. And I've asked everybody in the extended Kerouac world who would know, and nobody's ever heard of anybody ever touching this book, in part because it's written in dialect. Um, and this will only be the third time it's ever been done on a stage anywhere on planet Earth. Uh, once in a backyard. <laughs> Gubba and, and Patty Kid. Patty Kid. But only once in Lowell on a stage, once here yesterday. This is the third time anybody from, has ever performed from this book in the history of, a, of our species. And we get two species of girls. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky us. So, um, right, so it's written in dialogue and it's also. This was the version of On the Road that he wrote in the summer of summer and fall of 1950. Uh, so this was his attempt at telling the story that ultimately came, became Jack and Neil and Sal and Dean, what we were just reading from. Uh, and so he was trying to get, he was trying to tell the story of discovering America and going on the road. And he came up with, rather than him and Neil, he had a couple of black brothers an older black musician in New York City and his younger brother who was 10 years old in North Carolina. And uh, so the whole story is written from the voice of a 10 year old boy from North Carolina writing to his, or telling his grandpa about this massive on the road adventure that he just had. And so the book is, often you'll hear him say, grandpa, da 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 da, because he's talking to grandpa in this whole thing. So here we go. The only book Jack ever wrote in dialect. Yeah. The car's here. Yeah, my ride's here. Yeah. Maybe that's so well. Okay. Grandpa, I ain't gonna tell you too much about the bus, because a heap of doings was cropping up in New York. But I didn't have no notion of him in that bus, it just got. Well, brother and me paid the man some money, and then we walked back through the people in the seats, and everybody look at us, and we look at them, and then we sit down in the back sofa, only it ain't rightly a soft sofa. And then we sit looking straight ahead over everybody's head at the driver, and he turned off the light and zoom up the bus. And faster and faster we go with two big old lights leading us all the way through the land. Brother, he falled asleep right away. I stayed awake. I reckon we left North Carolina after about a half hour or two half hours. Cause the road done changed from brown to black. And on each side of it, I didn't see no more houses, just wilderness. I guess it was just the big old woods without no houses. And dark and black. It was the wilderness at Gastonia pray about it when she pray again it's so loud. And then here come the rain down on that wilderness. And the rain run wet and, and wild right through it. It was a scarifying thing to see and made a body glad he's in a bus with a whole lot of people. I watched everybody all night long, but they was mostly sleeping in their chairs, and it was too black to see. But I tried to see, but it wasn't no use. I sure didn't want to go to sleep that night. And I say to myself, Pick, you're going to New York. Ain't it something now, ain't it? And I prod myself and I feel good. And then eventually I get all sleepy, peculiar in my eyes, because I sleep this time of evening back home, and even over at Aunt Gastonia's too, so next thing I know, I just has to sleep. And that's all I done that night. Come about morning, I look up and see where I am, 
in a bus. I can't believe it. I say to myself, now that's why I'm bouncing so damn blame much. And I look over at brother, and he's still sleeping. And he's got the whole back sofa to himself, it's all stretched out, loose and peaceful. And I was pleased to see him sleep so, because I know he must be tired. And I just look out the window. And you know, I never seen anything so powerful, grand, and big. Now I've seen powerful and grander things since then, all the way to California. But what I see then was the first time I see the world, I tell you. And it was a great big river with a tree shawl on both sides, and it spread out yonder all flat, I guess, all the way to the sea. And way yonder, on a hill, there's a big old white house with posts on the porch, like I seed the night before. An ancestral home of a general, retired hero of Appomattoxburg or some such, as brother said. And on the other side of the river, I see a grand and fearsome housetop, all white and round, and just like a handsome cup upside down, with little bitty far right way trees and tidy little roofs underneath it. And the man up front said to his wife, yonder's the Capitol Dome, darling. <laughs> and point to it, and that's what it was. And then the finest, softest wind blew in from the land of the river and made everything ripple and jump in the water all over, most peaceful. And the sun shine on that grand, fine capital dome and hit flush on a streamer that's tied to a ghoul pool way up on top of it. And do it look dazzling? In all that land I told you we'd done roll over in the bus all night, here we was in the middle of it, because there never was a town so wide and so laid out grand. And brother woke up and said, this here's the city of Washington, the nation's capital where the president of the United States and everybody is. And he rubbed his eyes and looked close and can see there's a heap of things going on yonder in Washington, because I hear it hum all over when the bus slowed down at the river red light. And I put my head out the window to watch. Well, I never seen such a big sky with so many fine, solemn clouds as passed over Washington in the United States at morning. After that, Grandpa, I didn't get to sleep much. It is mighty hot inside the city of Washington when we stopped there and had to change to another bus that said, New York. And crowded, everybody in the world lined up for that New York bus and sat inside sweating. I couldn't sleep no more, except on brother's arm and had to sit straight up in that back sofa and drop my head over, most uncomfortable. And his poor shoulder was so hot, bus driver man say, Baltimore, next stop. <laughs> but then he run off and do something else instead and don't come back for the longest time. Well, I wished I was back in that night bus in the wilderness. Babies was crying all up and down that bus and felt just as bad as I did, I guess. And I look out the window and all I see is the wall on one side and the wall on the other and the sun beat down on the roof, and phew, it was so dang on hot, I was sickish. And I say to myself, why don't somebody open a window in here? And I look around, and everybody's sweating, but nobody makes a move for the window. I say to Slim, let's open a window, or we's dead. And Slim, he pull and tug and wrestle at that window, but he can't budge it one bit. Phew, he say. This must be one of them modern air-conditioned buses. Phew, Slim say. Let's go bus and blow some air in here. And a man up front turned around and give us a look. And then he tried to open his window, and he couldn't budge it neither. And he sweat and cuss over it. 
And then here comes a big soldier man. And he reach out and give that window one big pull up, but it don't budge none. So everybody just looks straight ahead and go on sweating. Well, you know, uh, that bus driver man, he come back. And he see Slim pulling on that window some more. And he said, please leave the windows alone. This happens to be an air conditioned bus. <laughs> and he turned on a button up front when he started the bus. And I tell you, the finest cool air began to blow all over that bus. Well, the thing is, everybody got cold in a minute. And the sweat turns on me like ice water. So Slim, he tugged on that window again to get some water air back in here. But couldn't do it. And we look out the window at that beautiful green field and Slim say, that was Maryland. And wished we were sitting out in the sunny grass. I wished everybody felt the same way too. Now Grandpa, traveling ain't the easiest and pleasingest thing in the world. But you sure gets to see many interesting things that don't go about it backwards, neither. When we got to Philadelphia, folks got out of the bus, and me and Slim got ourselves a new seat, smack dab up front by the driver's window, and bought up some ice-cold soda orange. Ain't nothing better when you're feeling sickish. And Slim say, we can sit up front now because we crossed the Mason-Dixie line. And I asked him what that was. And he said, that was the line of the law for Jim Crow. And when I asked him who Jim Crow was, he says, that's you, boy. I ain't no Jim Crow anyhow, I told him. You know my name's Pictorial Jackson? Oh, says Slim, is that so? Well, I never know that, uh-huh. Look here, Jim. Don't you know about that law that says you can't sit in the front of the bus when the bus runs below the Mason-Dixie line? What for you call me Jim? Ah, Jim, he says, and cluck, cluck at me all solemn. You mean to tell me you don't know about that line? What line, I say? I ain't seen no such a line. What? Well, we just crossed it back there in Maryland didn't you see old Mason and Dixie holding that line across the road? Well, he says, did we run over it or underneath it? And I was trying to recollect such a thing, but just can't. Well, I guess I must have been sleeping then. And Slim, he laughed and pushed my head and slapped his knee. Jim, you kill me. Well, what did that line look like, I asked him. I weren't old enough to know it was a joke yet. Well, Slim say he didn't know what such a line looked like neither, on account of he never seen it any more than I did. He say, but there is such a line. Only thing is, it ain't on the ground, and it ain't in the air neither. It's just in the head of old Mason and Dixie. Just like all them other lines, Border lines, state lines, parallel 38 lines, iron curtain lines. It's all just imaginary lines in people's heads and don't have nothing to do with the ground. Slim said that and then just got quiet. He didn't call me Jim no more. He said to himself, yes sir, that's all it is in people's heads. And the bus driver man come back and say, all aboard, New York. Like I tell you about traveling and not going backwards, we just went further. Woo! Straight ahead was that New York road. And all the traffic of the cars cutting in and out. Zoom! Zip! But that driver man just sit there at that wheel without losing a move and a muscle and look right ahead and push his big machine straight on through as fast as he can go. Anybody come out of a side street and see us coming, why they just freeze right up and let us come by. That bus man just cleared the way for himself, he don't care. The others don't care neither, because they just barely miss us and go zip this way and zip that away after they miss. 
I reckon his bus could never stop if somebody got dead in the way. Then you couldn't find the pieces if he didn't have to look for them in the next county. Grandpa, you never see such driving and breezing along and everybody so nonchalant about it. And so sure, I tell you, I couldn't look. And Slim, he was asleep again. And this time, his head dropped on my arm, just like mine done on his arm in Washington. And he slept like that with his eyes closed in front of the window. And here's that bus man, carrying him on through on all that road, just as faithful as you please. Slim weren't scared none, nor flinched awake. Well, I sure did uh, love him a whole lot right then. And I said to myself, Pick, you had no call being scared last night when he come and carried you through the woods and told you not to worry. Now, Pick, you gots to grow up this minute for Slim. You ain't no country boy no more. And there we go, north to Manhattan in that tremendous bus. Jack Kerouac. <laughs> I'll just uh, end with a, uh, a little piece about the Dalai Lama and uh, similar messages to uh, Spirit's Play tonight at 9.30. Don't miss it. I don't know which stage it's going to be on, but it's going to be great. <laughs>